Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Clayton Cosgrove. Mr Speaker, that was a um, very interesting speech by Colin King. It was a very interesting speech in its, in its so-called definition of democracy. In Mr King's small world, democracy apparently in the last two or three years since the commissioners have been in place, unelected, accountable to no one in Canterbury, accountable to their paymasters in Wellington, unelected but appointed. Apparently, uh, the province of Canterbury has enjoyed uninterrupted democratic activity. That's what George Spates Well, that's, yeah, that's what George Spates Well, I don't know. I think George Spates might have been a bit brighter than that. And apparently, democracy goes something like this in Mr King's little world, that if local authority elected folk, those that are left in the outer reaches of the province, those that haven't had their democratic rights cut asunder from them, are happy interacting with the commissioners, then this is nirvana in respect of democratic practice. I invite Mr King to do a couple of things. Maybe to talk to Peter Dunn, because I mean this in all seriousness, because Peter Dunn, I think, graduated from uh, the political science department with a, with a bachelor's in political science, I, I, master's of science, forgive me, master's in political science. And, and, and I'm sure, and I mean this in all seriousness, that Peter, Peter, the Honourable Peter Dunn, uh, what A grade version? Sorry? Great university, one I went to too, uh, could give Mr King a lesson on the sort of definitions uh, about democracy. Because I have to say to the member over there, Mr King, that uh, democracy means that you get a say, you get a vote, hopefully every three years, you have representation with taxation, as it were. Uh, that is the sort of tried and true uh, definition of democratic discourse uh, in, in a democratic nation. So I invite him maybe to get you know, grab hold of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. I'm sure he can dust a couple off there. He may not have progressed to the internet and some of that sort of amazing technology we've got now, but dust off the old Encyclopaedia Britannica and have a go, look up D under democracy and learn about it. Learn about it. Apparently you can Google it. But I say this is all about, this is all about a simple thing. This is about a government who came to power, took action and stripped out uh, uh, the right for Cantabrians to have a regional council that is voted in, then made a promise, and I refer back to the great quote of that uh, great genius Nick Smith, who said, quote, but whatever the circumstances, the next regional council elections in Canterbury will take place no later than the election scheduled, scheduled for late 2013. So what then, broken promise, there's another word for it, been used a bit liberally this afternoon, I think we know what it means, and every Cantabrian knows what it means. So what we're faced with in Canterbury is a rather extraordinary situation. We gave the government, in respect of the earthquake, wartime powers, Jerry Bradley wartime powers. There was some, controversial, uh, co there was some controversy about that. We voted for it on this side because we believed it would be appropriate to get things done. Sadly, uh, we now wonder if Mr Brownlee will ever dust off the warrant and actually use those powers in an appropriate way. We have a city council which is in great difficulty, apart from, and I mention a few names here, hoping not to destroy their political career, Tim Carter, Yanni Johansson, Glenn Livingston and others, elected people on that council that are trying to get some cohesion there, left wanting, sadly, by the mayor and the chief executive, a dysfunctional council, and then we have a regional council, of course, that exists, in effect, in name only, in terms of its uh, lack of democratic principles. And I mean no disrespect to the commissioners, because the commissioners are doing a job, but the question is who they are responsible to. You see, in the old days, Mr King, through you, sir, you could ring up a regional councillor, say, like Joe Kane, former deputy chair, good person, and say, hey, we've got a constituent who's got some problems. Can you sort them out for us? They may not be able to kick a goal, but they were accountable to the constituency that elected them. The problem with the commissioners, sir, and not a personal problem with them, is they are not accountable to people like us who live in Canterbury. They are not accountable to the local communities. They are accountable to this government. And because of that, that minister and this government will bear the responsibility for this. They made a commitment. They made an absolute commitment that 2013 democracy would be restored to Canterbury. And it is interesting, as Annie King said, that when you have a look at the regulatory impact statement, who was against this? Well, there was very, very little opposition to the proposition of restoring, through a transitional phase, democracy to Canterbury. The commissioners proposed option one, and option one for Mr King's sort of, you know, 
uh, you know, to, to inform him, was where you had elected and appointed, a combination of the two, elected and appointed, who would be a, a transition uh, to, a, to full democracy. The commissioners were in favour of that. The Department of Internal Affairs was in favour of that. Treasury said in the, in the uh, regulatory impact statement that there had been virtually no or no Crown-led consultation with stakeholders, government departments or the communities. Therefore, it was hard to provide proper advice on this. Very few people, very few people or agencies were opposed, at the very least, to option one, which was a transitional combination of appointed and elected folk to transition to democracy. But, oh no, the Minister and the Government know best. So what do we have in Canterbury in terms of uh, uh, participatory instruments to allow the community to have a say? Very little. Sadly, as I've said, we have a dysfunctional City Council. Secondly, we have an appointed and soon to be reappointed, now if this legislation goes through, uh, uh, um, regional authority. And we have Sarah, which, of course, with wartime powers and a minister with wartime powers, that effectively can do what they want. And they have done some good things. I accept that. They have made some blunders. We've already debated this afternoon, and I won't go there again, the sad state of affairs in respect of the, the draconian decision to cut across everybody in terms of our schools and the communities that sit alongside those schools. So the question I've got is why the broken promise? Because we hear a lot about water and a number of esoteric things, but it comes down to this. It comes down to a government, every one of them sitting there, goggle-eyed, from Canterbury and other places, who stared the constituencies in Canterbury in the face and said, you're going to get your democracy back in 2013, and now without even the support of the ECAN commissioners that that government and that minister appointed, they roll over the top and say, no, 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 it's going to be a total of six and a half years from the time we put on the original legislation. Basically, it's another three years, 2016, before you get a go. Now, I say that that is wrong. I say that a proper, not only is it wrong that the promise was broken, but it is wrong that this government hasn't even fronted up to the constituencies and the community and consulted with them and provided a justification as to why this legislation should be before us today. The usual sort of slipshod stuff, that is, punch a piece of legislation out, make an arbitrary decision, consult with nobody, don't take the advice of your officials, your appointed commissioners, the DIA or anybody else, and just make it happen. Well, I've got to say to Mr Carter, a long-standing member of this House, who has a, a member of his family, Tim Carter, who's doing an outstanding job, I say, on the Christchurch City Council along with others. But I say to Minister Carter and others that Cantabrians are getting to the point where they are having a gutsful of being driven over by the proverbial uh, political steamroller, either in the form of the Minister for Earthquake Recovery or in the form of the Minister of Education and now in the form of the Minister of Local Government, with no consultation, not even the meekest reference to engaging with the community. They're getting a bit tired. They're getting a bit stressed. They've got enough to cope with, and they wouldn't mind occasionally if somebody in the Wellington offices of the Beehive actually said, you can have a say. You can have a say. You can be the masters, perhaps, of your own destiny, um, and by the way, we in Wellington and they in Wellington and government feel that there is leadership capability in Canterbury, that there are smart people and innovators in Canterbury, that there are entrepreneurial and socially entrepreneurial people who could take control of an organisation like ECAN, show some acumen, show some a high degree in world-class management, and actually run the show. Because last time I checked, I don't think of all roads of intellect and the monopoly on all knowledge and all good ideas emanated from the Minister of Local Government's office or the ninth floor or the seventh floor of the Beehive. Have you got evidence for that? Well, Jerry Brownlee will be around here somewhere, I'm sure. He provides enough evidence of that. But I just say in all seriousness, people are actually entitled to have a say, or at the very least, 
If this crew is going to march forward and punch this legislation through, then they have a duty, Mr King, under our little democracy, to make the case and justify the position to the people of Canterbury. They have not made the case, they have not justified the position, and this bill is a disgrace, and yet again, they think they know best, and the boot goes in to Cantabrians. Mr Speaker. I call Tim McIndoe. Like most who have ever lived in Christchurch, I have fond memories of the beauty of the city's landscape.